Imagine a cold river at dawn, a thin veil of mist resting on the surface, so quiet you can hear a single drop fall. Suddenly a massive log seems to tilt. The water bursts and a broad shield-like head rises. Conical teeth snap shut exactly where a fish had been an instant before. This is not a crocodile. This is Kula Sukus. A giant amphibian from the early Cretaceous. And the question is simple and unsettling. If it existed today, what would happen to us? Kula Sukus was the last representative of an ancient amphibian lineage called Temnospondyls, once thriving long before mammals and birds took over the world. It lived in what is now Southern Australia, roughly 120 to 125 million years ago. Its body plan was engineered for underwater ambush. An adult stretched to about three meters long, near 10 feet, and could have weighed close to half a metric ton. The skull is estimated at about 65 centimeters, over two feet, astonishingly broad and flat, with small bony projections at the rear. In the mouth, beyond the ring of conical teeth, sat extra fangs mounted on the palate. Those palatal tusks were perfect for pinning slippery prey. A wide head, a low barge of a body, powerful forelimbs to lunge and stout hind limbs to kick, a moist absorbent skin like other amphibians, and a system of sensory grooves along the head and trunk to read vibrations in murky water. Even when visibility was poor, it could map a whole bend of the river by feel. Its ancient home was a world of cold, fast rivers at high latitudes, because the region that became Victoria lay much farther south during the early Cretaceous. Winters were long and daylight rhythms were strange. Water ran swift through gravel channels, and the temperature was too low for crocodiles. In that chill, crocodiles were absent, and Kulasukas became the apex predator of the river. When the climate warmed later, crocodiles returned, and the balance shifted against it. That lesson still matters. If a living population of Kulasukas faced our present world, the borders of its habitat would slide with water temperature. Climate does not only move weather fronts, it reshapes who rules the riverbank. Now bring the camera to the 21st century. It is early morning on an upland stream in Southern Australia. The water is glassy on top and murky only half a meter down. The shot glides low along reeds and over a silent eddy tucked beneath a fallen tree. The moment a paddle passes, there is a gentle tug at the bow of the kayak. It is not a rock. It is current pulled by a very large body turning in place. A Kulasukas is lying there, motionless like a boulder with algae. When salmon run across its snout, it flexes a wrist, opens that wide trap of a mouth, and the river itself funnels prey between its jaws. You might not notice it. The water notices you. That is how a master ambush hunter disappears in plain sight. In a homecoming scenario, Kulasukas would reappear in cold, oxygen-rich tributaries of Victoria and perhaps Tasmania. It would choose clean reaches with stony bottoms that allow it to bury in shallow scoops. Most days it would vanish into the riverbed. When it hunts, it becomes a streak of darkness, drives a fish to the gravel and settles again as if nothing happened. For people that means quiet infrastructure must change its posture. Low causeways, culverts, and grassy urban margins around Melbourne or Geelong would go from casual walkways to places where an invisible hunter may lie. Seasonal warning signs would become routine. Avoid paddling at dawn and dusk. Create no swim zones for children and pets during the cold months. Install sloped guardrails along promenades, mesh screens on small dams, and redesign fish ladders with shallow, narrow chutes that reduce ambush opportunities infrastructure would not just move water anymore. It would negotiate with a survivor from deep time. Ecology would shift in ways that are not automatically negative. With palatal tusks that clamp large fish, Kulasukas could push down invasive carp in reaches that stay cold enough, letting aquatic plants rebound and water clarity improve. Yet there would be real pressure on native fishes and species that support commercial or recreational harvest. Its distribution would draw a moving front line with crocodiles. 
Warmer, slow water favors crocodiles. Colder, fast water favors Kulasukas. In a warming world, that line would creep upstream year by year. New medical and veterinary concerns would surface. As an amphibian with permeable skin, Kulasukas would be extremely sensitive to chytrid fungal disease, heavy metals, and microplastics. A sudden local decline could ring an alarm about water quality, turning this predator into a living indicator. On the other hand, if curious people tried to hunt or eat it, bioaccumulated contaminants would pose obvious health risks. In protected facilities, it would require chilled flow through pools year-round, cobble and gravel to dig into, infrared cameras, temperature, and dissolved oxygen loggers, routine fungal testing, and large harness-style GPS trackers for short-term releases in enclosed channels. To conserve a primordial hunting machine, we would have to run a full modern machine of science. What if Kulasukas crossed borders? Picture a river in British Columbia, Scandinavia, Patagonia, or New Zealand's South Island. Surface water is clear, and the bottom is a lacework of roots and cavities. It could take a seat there almost overnight. Its new neighbors would include river otters, brown bears in the lower reaches, and human anglers in waders. A test bite at a rubber boot, not out of malice but confusion, would be enough to spark panic. Private ownership would have to be banned. Transport channels would need tight control. Biosecurity would mean quarantine protocols, mandatory microchipping of every research animal, and wide seasonal buffers around spawning ground. One escape could force an entire watershed to change habits. In laboratory, or semi-free settings. Kulasukas would offer a window into the past. We could study gas exchange and thermal balance in a giant amphibian adapted to cold water, measure performance as temperature swings, and test how a top-down predator reshapes dull, silted streams. The challenges are real. This animal climbs and wriggles with surprising skill, tolerates heat poorly, and hides brilliantly. Enclosures must be escape-proof, Water must be hospital clean, and staff must train like zookeepers who care for crocodilians and giant salamanders at once. Public education would be the other half. Respect and caution without sensationalism would be the tone. Conservation is not putting a creature in a glass tank. It is learning to coexist with a moving shadow underwater. Policy and ethics would march with engineering. A three-meter, half-ton river predator living where people recreate demands rules similar to those for large carnivores. Any bridge or dam project within its range would require permits and risk mitigation. During breeding season, there might be temporary closures or detours along riverside trails. Public guidance would need to be blunt and calm. Do not enter the water when visibility is poor. Do not dump live bait. Do not nose a kayak into root tangle cavities and culvert mouths. A compensation fund for rare incidents could sit beside a conservation fund that recognizes the scientific value of a living remnant of the temnospondyl line. If you happen to meet one, stay composed. When a very large log-like shape lies sideways in cold, tea-colored water, do not wade directly across. Move to higher bank and go around. While paddling, give wide berth to rock holes, submerged root masses, and culvert mouths because those are classic ambush stages. If children or pets play in water, choose shallow, clear stretches under half a meter deep and avoid dawn and dusk. If you find a big fish carcass with circular scrape marks as if suctioned, take photographs, record the location, and notify the authorities. Reading the signs is the key to staying ahead of a nearly invisible hunter. After all this, the question is not simply whether we want Kulasukas back. The real question is, how we would coexist if it returned. On one side lies very real risk that asks infrastructure to adapt and fisheries to learn new rules. On the other is a remarkable opportunity. Rivers could regain energy. Scientists would gain a living climate indicator. All of us would regain a sense that evolutionary history is not finished. On a bitter morning somewhere, a river might bulge with the faintest push from below two pale, unblinking eyes, a flat shield of a head, one ring of ripples gliding outward, and then stillness. In that moment, we would understand that Earth does not only keep fossils in stone. Sometimes it allows an old story to rise and test our willingness to share the water. And if the past does rise from the riverbed, are we ready to move with it? 
Or will we stand on shore and tremble before a nameless shadow, 